now, um, Kathy Lewis will be introducing Dustin Lance Black, but it's my honor to introduce Kathy Lewis, who's a popular speaker, corporate facilitator, and broadcaster. With expertise in civil discourse and civic engagement, Kathy believes that powerful conversations can change the world. A veteran public broadcaster, Kathy Lewis has hosted a live midday radio talk show since 1996 on WHRB 89.5 public radio for Hampton Roads. She also directs a major regional leadership organization which engages senior level leaders and trusteeship of the Hampton Roads region. She's currently Old Dominion University's Community Engagement Liaison for the Office of University Advancement. So please welcome Kathy. If I ask you tonight about your own guiding principles, your own core values, the beliefs that make you, you, could you answer that question? It's a great exercise that helps give shape and meaning to our lives. Ideas can motivate us, movements can sweep us up, individuals can inspire us to be more or to be who we were meant to be. But few of us have the opportunity to honor the individual who inspired them in a more powerful way than our speaker tonight. When asked about his reason for being here on Earth, Dustin Lance Black answered simply, for me, that's milk. Harvey Milk, the iconic civil rights leader assassinated in 1978. Milk inspired the 13-year-old Dustin Lance Black and gave him hope to live his life openly as who he is. After visiting San Francisco at the height of the AIDS epidemic in the early 90s, Black saw a documentary about Harvey Milk and spent the next three years researching Milk's life. The result was the 2008 film Milk, which won an Oscar for Best Original Screenplay. Along the way, Black signed on to draw from his Mormon childhood experiences as a writer and co-producer of HBO's Big Love and wrote a screenplay about the life of Pedro Zamora, an openly gay cast member of the reality show Real World. Today, he splits his creative time to advocate for LGBTQ equality at the federal level. He's a founding board member of the American Foundation for Equal Rights, which led the federal case against Proposition 8 in California. Just this year, Black created a play called 8, based on that court case, in fact, ODU Out and the ODU Theater Department are presenting performances of eight tomorrow through Friday at the University Theater, and part of the proceeds will go to ODU Out. It was February of 2009 when our guest tonight accepted the Oscar for Milk in an acceptance speech that was elegant and moving. So ladies and gentlemen, let's learn more about a man whose creative genius makes us think and act, Dustin Lance This was um, this was not an easy film to make. And first off, I have to thank Clee Jones and Ann Cronenberg and all the real life people who shared their stories with me. And um, Gus Van Sant, Sean Penn, Emil Hurst, Josh Brolin, James Franco, and our entire cast, my producers Dan Jinks and Bruce Cohen, everyone at Grounds One Focus for taking on the challenge of telling this life-saving story. When I was 13 years old, my beautiful mother and my father moved me from a conservative Mormon home in San Antonio, Texas to California, and I heard the story of Harvey Milk. And it gave me hope. It gave me the hope to live my life. It gave me the hope to one day I could live my life openly as who I am, and that maybe even I could fall in love and one day get married. Uh, who has always loved me for who I am, even when there was pressure not to. But most of all, if Harvey had not been taken from us 30 years ago, I think he'd want me to say to all of the gay and lesbian kids out there tonight who have been told that they are less than by their churches, or by the government, or by their families, that you are beautiful, wonderful creatures of value. And that no matter what anyone tells you, God does love you, and that very soon, I promise you, you will have equal rights federally across this great nation of ours. Ladies and gentlemen, Dustin Lance 
when I was uh, like six years old, so I was a little kid, and if you're in Texas and you're growing up Mormon, which I was, I mean, I went to this little Mormon church in this thing called Randolph Ward, and on special Sundays, they would bring down this big screen and they'd beam in by a satellite the prophet of the Mormon church. At the time, it was Spencer W. Kimball. And little six-year-old Lance is looking up. It's like sci-fi, this old man talking down at me. And, and he said, uh, a quote that I'll read you, he said, homosexuality is sin. Next to the crime of murder comes this sin of sexual impurity. And I was six, and I'm staring at this screen, and I'm like, that's the most fabulous word I've ever heard. <laughs> I have no idea what it means, but the syllables, I mean, clearly I was a future writer. I thought it was fantastic. I just didn't know what it meant. But, you know, things got a little rougher for me after that. And by six, almost seven years old, my good Mormon father had taken off and abandoned the family. Uh, maybe to go search for some more wives here or there. <laughs> and he left me with my mom. And uh, a little bit about my mom, she uh, had polio when she was a kid, so she paralyzed. So all of a sudden there's this paralyzed woman in braces and crutches with three little boys and no real way to raise them. And you know who stepped in and saved us? The U.S. military. The U.S. military came to this paralyzed woman and said, Ma'am, we will give you the skills to be able to afford to raise your boys on your own. They taught her how to drive and they taught her medicine and she went into the medical field of Fort Sam Houston. She started raising her boys and I was incredibly grateful for that. But I also learned some new words there too. <laughs> right? Uh, words like turd burglar. <laughs> Cocksucker, faggot, all these words. They were much more colorful than the Mormon words. But I still didn't quite know what they meant. But I was learning, I was learning. And then there was this one day, you know, there was this sort of one moment. And uh, I was probably about seven years old at this point. And I remember I was sitting there in the garage of my house. And there was this kid, this older kid down the street who was friends with my big brother. Tough guys, these guys. He was like nine and he could kick my ass, I was sure. And he was walking around with this spray-painted car, spray-painted black, used to be clearly red car, that had just gone missing from my house, not a few days earlier. And I was like, I was so angry as he walked away from me with my stolen car. I couldn't go to my mom, we were broke, we couldn't afford new toys. Didn't want to put any more trauma on my mom that we had a, a klepto on the loose in the neighborhood. And, uh, and, and so I, my heart started to race, I remember so clearly, and I stopped breathing through my nose, and I stopped breathing altogether, and I got so upset. It wasn't because I wanted to beat him up, it's because I had such a big crush on him. <laughs> and how dare he do this to me? How dare he broke my heart? And I thought, that was the moment. It took one second later, I thought, oh my goodness, all of those words, all of those words are about me. And I'm right down there at six, seven years old, all three foot, four inches of me. I'm right down there with all the sinners and the murderers and the rapists. And I knew from my leaders that I needed to hide. I knew that if I came out, according to my leaders, I'd bring great shame to my family and great harm. And it was a very dark place, and I just tried to blend in. I tried not to excel. I tried not to stick out. It's what so many young LGBT kids do across this country. They try not to stick out so they don't get bullied or abused. But I got a little turn of luck. Now, my mom met this hot little army soldier guy, and he was a Catholic. And he had orders to ship off to California. And so she married him. And we moved off to California. And we ended up in Monterey, which is sort of central coast. It's really close to uh, San Francisco and all that, Fort Ord. And all of a sudden, my mom was in love, I think, for the very first time in her life. And she said, I want to, if I'm going to feel this good and this free, I want my little son to feel this free and this good. And he's so shy and so weird and doesn't talk to other people. So I'm going to, I'm going to put him into drama club. <laughs> what my mom thought drama club was all about. It's not usually the most butch club on campus, so I liked it. I liked it a whole hell of a lot. And, and it only took me about a year or so where I went from high school theater up to this community college theater, and pretty soon I was doing professional theater up in San Francisco in my teenage years, and I was just loving it to death. And uh, I, I loved it so much partly because I was also starting to see out gay and lesbian people. And they didn't seem miserable. And they didn't seem broken, and there were no horns coming through their hair. And one of them in particular, this guy who ran the apprentice workshop that I was in, and I, I don't know why he decided to play this for us. Maybe he saw that some of us might have needed to hear it. But he played a speech, and it was delivered on June 9th, 1978, the year that my family landed in San Antonio, Texas, originally. 
And it goes like this. Somewhere in Des Moines, or San Antonio, there's a young gay person who all of a sudden realizes that she or he is gay. Knows if the parent finds out they'll be tossed out of the house, that classmates will taunt the child, and the Anita Bryants and John Briggs are doing their bit on TV, and that child has several options. Staying in the closet. Suicide. And then that one day, that child might open up the paper and it says, homosexual elected in San Francisco, and there are two new options. One is to go to California, or they can stay in San Antonio and fight. You've got to elect gay people, so that young child, the thousands upon thousands, like that child, know there is hope for a better world, there is hope for a better tomorrow. And that speech was given right there in San Francisco by a man named Harvey Bernard Milk. And he was the first leader in my entire life that was not leading with intimidation and not leading with fear. He was leading with hope. And for the first time in my life, his brand of hope actually included me. And gave me my life back. He gave me my, my, my first confidence. Confidence enough to, to leave home and to go to UCLA, where I met a lot of other people. And I discovered a little ghetto called West Hollywood. And I came out. And I started flirting with boys. And I started dating. And I even had a crush on this one guy. I was in college at UCLA. And he was this uh, much older man. He was 22 years old and a grad student. And, uh, and he really wasn't giving me the time of day because I was just some sort of little squirt that he didn't care about, care about listening to. And I was thinking about him on my flight home for Christmas break to Virginia. Because my family got moved. They got, they got moved from Fort Ord, which was closing down, to Walter Reed Army Medical, and they'd settled down in Manassas, Virginia. And so I'm flying out for my Christmas break, and I haven't really spent much time out in Virginia yet or D.C. yet, and I'm a little nervous. I'm like, boy, what am I going to talk about? Because so much has changed, but guess what? I'm not out to my family, nor do I think I can be. And we've always been really open with each other and shared everything with each other, so they're going to know something. So, and I'm thinking about all this, and, and all of a sudden the plane lands at Dulles Airport, and my stepdad's right there to get me. And he, he takes me and he puts me in the car and we drive off into the woods uh, to my folks' house out there in Virginia. And, and I, I just remember seeing my mom at the door so happy to see me. And she wrapped me up in her arms and I thought, boy, I wonder if she'd be doing this if she knew, uh, if she knew who I really was. And there standing next to her is my big brother. And he's that tough guy still. And he always has been. He's a, you know, he likes watching cars go around in circles repeatedly. <laughs> shooting things for fun and killing it. Uh, and he had a, like Megadeth and Metallica posters. I had my new kids on the block and NSYNC posters. <laughs> he gave me endless grief about that, so I covered it up with Paula Abdul, but that didn't quite work for him either. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so, you know, it was just like he and I had always just been oil and water, and I, I thought, boy, I, I love my family, but I don't think that these guys are ever going to accept me for me. And, I just remember we raced, I raced through Christmas morning and opening up presents and, and then it was Christmas dinner and I ate as fast as I could and just didn't sort of say anything, make sure my mouth was full the whole time so I didn't have to contribute. And I raced upstairs and I went to bed and I thought, oh, I made it. I didn't have to talk about anything. I went perfectly fine. And then I hear this sound coming down the hallway, this click clack sound. It goes click clack, click clack, click clack. And it's the sound I've heard my whole life. It's my mom coming on her braces and crutches down the hallway. And she opens up my door and she sits down on the bed and she just starts talking about politics, about what's in the news. And, and honestly, it's nothing unusual. This is what we've always done. But now I'm terrified. And she's rambling on about something that was really on her nerves. She, uh, she, she was really upset about this thing in the news at the time called Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Now, she wasn't angry about it because uh, it excluded people. She was angry that gay and lesbian people could be in her military at all, even if it was them keeping a secret. She's like, how dare these broken people be allowed in the military? And, uh, and as she went on and on and on, I just remember sitting there, and my face was becoming so hot and red, and I felt it. I felt, you know, tears coming from my eyes, and I, I prayed to will them back in. I did not want to cry in front of her. I did not want to come out that day. I wasn't ready. She looked at me, and uh, and she knew she's a mom. She knew, 
and I could just look in her eyes. She didn't have to say anything. I could tell she was so scared for her son. She was so upset that perhaps she had something to do with creating a broken son, a damaged son, and didn't know how to fix him. And, you know, we didn't, we didn't resolve that. We didn't resolve that on that trip. I flew home without much of a resolution, and, you know, I thought, boy, is this going to be my coming out story? Is it going to be one of these? And, and, I, and, I, and I went, and, you know, my friends were sort of picking up on some grief. I didn't want to tell them the details, but they're like, why are you so worried about your mom coming uh, for graduation in a couple months? I said, oh, I know, I know, it's my mom. And uh, they said, well, we'll just make her some pasta and uh, some salad. And, you know, some of them had met her before, and then you will have a dinner. It's going to be fine. I said, oh, okay. All right, good. And, uh, and then within a few months, there she was. There she was at my door, and I heard the click clack sound, click clack, click clack, click clack. She comes in, my friends are all there with their salads and their pastas. <laughs> and I'll admit something to you right now. I 100% completely copped out. Uh, I, I never told any of my friends that my mom uh, had any problem with gay and lesbian people, that my mom had any problem with me. Um, and I didn't tell my mom that most of my friends now were gay and lesbian. So, you know, when she comes into the room, I'm a little terrified. And I start to, I start to back off into the kitchen, and I see my friends serving her pasta and serving her salad and all this sort of thing. And I quickly realize as I start to talk to her that because I haven't said anything, they assume that this woman loves her gay son. And this is like pre-Will and Grace. This is pre-Ellen. This is like, she's a goddamn saint. And they all want to talk to her about their coming out experience, who they are, right? Their parents that rejected them and how bad that felt. They want to talk about their dating life. They want to talk about the sex they're having with their partner. So I'm freaking out. I'm like back in the kitchen now, and they're all leaving. My friends are leaving one by one by one. And I'm sweating and, and, and pretty soon it's just me and her and she uh, passed the chair next to her and I come and sit down uh, next to my mom and she says so I uh, I like your friends <laughs> okay yeah I do I like my friends too and she said I uh, I met that one that 22 year old grad student I was like oh good uh, boy uh, and she said I, you know I, I got to talking to him quite a bit and you know I told him the next time you go out to dinner, he better pay, and he better start treating you better. <laughs> and I, I'll tell you, that was the moment. I felt something inside of me light up I never felt in my entire life. And she wrapped her arms around me. I'm going to cry thinking about it. And she wrapped her arms around me. And for the very first time in my life, I knew that she loved me for me, that she understood me. And it took one night, it took one night of hearing actual gay and lesbian people, hearing about their real stories, who they really are, what they've been through, to dispel generations, decades of lies and myths and distortions about LGBT people, erased, gone, in one night. And I thought, my goodness, is that the power of telling our stories? Is that the power of your personal story? Is that the power of who we are and where we come from? And I said, if that is, then that's what I'm dedicating my life to. I'm dedicating my life to telling stories of the others, of the us's, of the folks who are different, starting with gay and lesbian stories. So I graduate from college, and if it's a, if it's a reality show, I'm doing the gay episode, much to the producer's chagrin often. Uh, if, it's a, if it's a TV movie, I'm doing the Pedro Zamora story. And you know what? Within 10 years, I got an opportunity to do something big. You know, I, I, I was doing pretty well. I was on a big HBO TV show, and you know, a, a big love, talking about Mormon fundamentalism, really pissing off that whole side of the family. <laughs> Should have just been good fun. But no, I, uh, I said, I really want to now tell the story of Harvey Milk. And why? Why do I want to tell that story? And I'll tell you, it's because this is a guy who led me to hope. But where did he come from? What was his deal? Where was he from? Where do you want to take us to? And that's what was so inspiring to me. You have to understand that speech I wrote you, or if you saw the movie Milk. Did people see the movie Milk in here? That is the only correct answer. Yeah, if you saw that movie, uh, the, thing, the thing you might miss about Milk is that when he gave that speech, when he started to leave, 
he did so in a time when it was a felony to be gay in California, and when it was still a mental illness. So when he started trying to spread hope to the hopeless kids out there, when he started to speak out and liberate people, he did so knowing he would be labeled a madman and a felon. That's where he came from. But he also came from a place where he knew that lives were being lost, and he wanted to stop that. And he said, you know, where I want to take us to is a place where we talk openly about who we are. We tell our story openly. We act like a proud people. We do not demand crumbs of equality. We demand the entire thing because we need to show respect for ourselves. And how do we get there? We start building coalitions with other minority groups. And he didn't mean going out there and asking them to work for him. He went to these groups, to the racial minority groups in San Francisco, to the women's groups, to the unions, in fact, these unexpected allies. And he said, what is it I and my people can do for you? And through that outreach and education, through coming out, and through coalition building, Harvey Milk beat a thing called Proposition 6. 30 plus years ago now, a statewide initiative to take away the jobs of gay and lesbian people in public schools, he beat it. In a time that was... <laughs> but where was I at the time when I was doing Mill? Well, I was facing a thing called Proposition 8 in California, which again was going to take away the rights of gay and lesbian people statewide. But what were my leaders doing? They had completely lost their history. They'd forgotten about Mr. Milk. There were no gay and lesbian people in the ads. It was the most closeted campaign I had ever seen. And outreach and education, no. I, I saw plenty of signs in the gay neighborhoods and in gay windows. But what about the racial minorities? What about going to black neighborhoods and the Latino neighborhoods? What about talking to women's groups and unions? What about reaching out to conservatives and Republicans and understanding this thing is a real civil rights fight, not some red-blue divide? They weren't doing any of it. So for me, I felt I had to revive that message. I had to revive or help revive that successful strategy. Now, here was the big damn problem. There was this other huge producers and a giant studio that had been trying to make a Harvey Milk movie forever, for like 20 years. Now, I've been floundering and floundering and floundering, and I have a lot of ideas of why it was floundering. Um, but I went to them to try and get their job. And I said to him, I said, hey, you know, I'm really, really passionate about this. I've done all this, this uh, reading on it. I know I'm just a baby TV writer, but maybe give me a shot. And they said, hey, listen, if you can go convince uh, the studio and the director, uh, then, then it's all yours. And I went and I convinced that studio. And I convinced that director and came back and they're like, well, we're not quite sure. Uh, you know, what, what specifically is this going to look like? What's it going to sound like? And I was like, okay. Uh, so I, I went further because I could tell they were hesitant. And I started driving up to San Francisco every single weekend on my own dime and meeting with the real life people, the real life gay lesbian people that worked with Harvey Milk, the straight allies that worked with him, even some of the people who couldn't stand him. And I got all that information, I started to put it together into a movie, and I built this whole damn movie before I even had the job. And I went in to pitch it to these hesitant producers once more, and I pitched the whole thing head to toe. And they sat there staring at me, wishing I wasn't in front of them, and said, I'm sorry, uh, Lance. The truth is, is we just want to write her with an Academy Award. So I want to thank Harvey Milk for thinking, thank him for helping me fill that gaping hole in my resume. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, as we're talking about leadership, we're talking about where a drive to lead comes from. If it's rooted in that personal place, whenever you hear that word no, you go, oh really? <laughs> yeah. And so what I did is I went and found Gus Van Sant, who I'd met just once before, and I said, do you want to do this? And he said, yes. And I drove up and, together with Gus to meet a guy I'd never met before, who I thought might punch me in the face, a guy named Sean Penn. I said, do you want to do this? <laughs> I had never produced a movie before. I didn't know what I was doing, but all of a sudden I had a movie with Sean Penn and James Franco and Gus Van Sant. The studios couldn't say no, and I was doing it. And we were getting it made. And I was up in San Francisco and I was so damn proud of what I put together and so excited about what we had achieved and so determined to make sure it turned out right that I wasn't answering my cell phone. And uh, I just wasn't answering it, wasn't answering it at all. And, and there was this one phone call, a uh, voicemail I kept ignoring in particular, which was from my big brother. You know, my big brother, you know, besides being a tough guy, he was always the guy who, you know, he tried smoking first and drinking first and drugs first. He was always getting into trouble. There was always a, a problem, a 
of some sort. And he, uh, and so I finally got around to calling him back like on a Sunday. And I picked up and I heard his voice and it was that, that sound that there was a heavy weight on him. I said, hey man, what's, what's up? You know, uh, did you get a girl pregnant? Did you, uh, did you wreck a car? What happened? And, and he said, no, 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 it's none of that, bro. I, um, <clears throat> do you know Larry? I said, yeah, yeah, I know, I know Larry. You guys sit in the basement, get drunk, and watch cars go in circles. <laughs> he said, yeah, Larry. I said, um, yeah, what's up? And he said, Larry broke up with me. <laughs> I said, what? what? <laughs> he said, yeah, um, Larry, uh, Larry broke up with me. We were maybe a year ago, we were down in the basement together and we were watching a race and we were having a couple beers and we kissed. And uh, it just felt, felt like the most truthful thing that's ever happened to me. Like I understood myself for the first time. And nothing has ever felt so right or true in my life before, bro. I was like, okay. He said, but Larry can't do it anymore. He's scared. He's scared, so he says it has to end. And I was like, oh, wow, I'm the man for this job. <laughs> I pulled out every hope speech there was. I gave him every it gets better speech that I had on my sleeve. Kept giving it to him and giving it to him. And guess what? I could never, ever hear the sound of liberation and freedom in his voice or in his heart that I had in mind when I came out. And it dawned on me what a fool I had been. Of course I felt free. Of course I felt liberated. I came out in Los Angeles. I came out in California, where we have laws protecting us, where we can't lose our job, and we can't lose our home if we come out. So people are coming out. People are dispelling the myths and the stereotypes. There is a community and there is support. He grew up in Texas and was living in Virginia, where there was no support. Where if you come out, you can lose your job. If you come out, you can lose your home. So people aren't coming out. They're not dispelling the myths and the lies and the stereotypes, especially in the communities he holds dear. So he has every reason to be afraid. He has every reason not to feel hopeful. And it broke my heart. So all of a sudden, I have to take my, where, are, where am I going with this thing? i got to move it. And in a few months, I had this great honor uh, of, of getting up on that stage you saw there and giving that speech in front of a whole lot of people. And, uh, and I said in that speech at the very end, if you're listening closely, I said, I made a promise to the young people across this country that they will have equal rights federally across this great nation. Yeah. And then I went on to do a march on Washington with Cleve Jones and Lady Gaga, which was pretty cool. <laughs> and in front of 250,000 people in front of the Capitol, I said this, we the gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people of America demand that the promise of the Constitution and Declaration of Independence be honored. We demand that the federal government act immediately, decisively, and unequivocally to ensure equal protection under the law for LGBT people throughout the United States of America full and equal federal rights. And why? Because I want my win in California to apply to my brother in Virginia. When I win on that coast, I want him to feel protected and respected here. I don't want to leave anybody behind. And you know, and you know what happened after that speech? I thought I was going to get all this hate mail from like the religious right or whatnot. Nothing. And I got, in fact, the most criticism from within the gay and lesbian community. And it was hard, because I was new to this. And they said, you know, you need to quiet down and back down. There's a strategy in place, and we got it just fine, which didn't seem true, seeing what happened with Proposition 8 in my state. And they said, you know, you might incite a backlash with this by asking for too much. And I, I brought this concern. You know, when you win an Oscar, there's this really cool thing that happens where you get to meet your heroes. Uh, if you just kind of call up, and there's this one named Julian Bond. Do you guys know who he is? Yes. Cool, right? So Julian Bond was always one of my great heroes, and I get to have lunch with him, and I'm bringing up this problem. And he said to me this, he said, Lance, good things do not come to those who wait. They come to those who agitate. Yeah. <laughs> 
it reminded me of a Harvey Milk quote, uh, Harvey Milk in 1973, when some of those very same people, by the way, were telling him to shut up and not run, that it was too soon for an openly gay candidate, he said this to them, he said, masturbation can be fun, <laughs> but it does not take the place of the real thing. It is about time for the gay community to stop playing with itself and get down to the real thing. <laughs> who are satisfied with crumbs because that is all they think they can get, when in reality, if they demand the real thing, they will find that indeed they can get it. And so I said, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go find some people smarter than me, like Chad Griffin, who's running a human rights campaign now, and Rob Reiner, and Bruce Cohen, and I am going to, with them, help found the American Foundation for Equal Rights, and we are going to sue the state of California in federal court, saying that Proposition 8 is unconstitutional. The gay and lesbian people do indeed deserve the protection of the Constitution and the 14th Amendment. And I don't know if any of you have been paying any attention, but we've been winning. We won in California at the district court level. The next level is the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And guess what? We won there too. And I thought, boy, we are one step away. All this has to go to now is the US Supreme Court. This case, or a case like it. And my win will be my brother's win. My freedom will be my brother's freedom. I will finally get the chance to hear in his voice what I felt when my mother held me in her arms. And I wanted to rush to that phone and call my big brother and share that good news. But a few months ago, my big brother passed away. He lost his fight with cancer. And he will never, in his lifetime, feel what I felt. He will never have the hope that he can fall in love and that love will be protected and respected in the state he loved, because he loved Virginia. He'll never have that. And it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy, but it's a tragedy of geography in an unequal nation. It's a tragedy because he grew up in Texas and because he grew up in Virginia, and that is not American, is it? It's a tragedy because too long we've been in a movement that is satisfied with crumbs, the crumbs that Harvey Milk detested, and they're not showing the bravery to ask for the full thing. So why am I here? Why am I here in Virginia instead of making more money in Hollywood tonight and doing that whole thing. I'm here because that's where I want to take us. I want to take it, us to a place where my win is my brother's win, where we're not leaving any of our brothers and sisters behind anymore. And I want your help to continue to tell your personal stories, to change minds here in Virginia, to move things forward here in Virginia. And I want to thank this campus especially for doing the Play 8 so people know what's about to be argued in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. That's what I want to do, and that's my passion. That's where I'm from and want to go. I guess I, I, I really want to know, though, for the students here in particular, I want to know where you want to go. I want to know what your passion is, what that thing is that's so part of who you are that you don't care how many times you have to hear no. You're going to get it done. Because you're some of the most promising, gifted people in this nation right now, and we need you. And you're capable of leading your fellow man, let's be honest, into new frontiers, making this life more exciting, more livable, more comprehensible, aren't you? And I want to know where you're going to take us. I want to know what it is you are going to give of yourselves to build bridges. To build bridges to other communities, to build bridges of understanding, to build bridges into the future. Because we still have a long way to go in this world, don't we? And not just in arts, not just in writing, but also in science, in economics, in commerce, in art. We have so much further to go. So I want to ask you tonight to just remember one thing if you don't remember anything else. And that's this. It's that regardless of whatever major you are, whatever passion you have, wherever you're from, I want you to be cautious of one kind of person. Be cautious of the person who's cautious. Be cautious of the person who leads with hesitancy and fear. Be cautious of the person who accepts the status quo as the truth. I want you to ask questions. I want you to challenge assumptions. 
I want you to tackle that status quo. And I want you to give of who you are to start to change this world and to change this beautiful country into a place where we no longer leave any of our brothers and sisters behind. Thank you very much.